I'm Jonah Comstock, Editor-in-Chief of Farm Reform, and I'm here at the Novo Nordisk Foundation headquarters in Copenhagen. I'm joined by Melissa Little, CEO of the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Stem Cell Medicine, uh, also known as Renew. Thanks for joining me, Melissa. It's a great pleasure. So tell me a little bit about Renew um, and, and the goals uh, that you have around stem cell research. So Renew is a global research consortium that has researchers in the stem cell space in the, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, and in Australia. So it's really quite an amazing global consortium. Our objective is to actually do the highest quality stem cell biology research, but actually encourage and enable our researchers to pivot that outcome towards product development and really try and accelerate the development of products out of stem cells, whether that is drugs to treat uh, currently incurable diseases by modeling disease or cellular therapies or gene modified cellular therapies into men. So tell me a little more about uh, disease modeling with stem cells. Yes, so the fact that you can take any adult cell and take it back to a pluripotent state and then differentiate that into specific cell types means that we can start to model patient-specific diseases. So we generate stem cells from patients, particularly in the uh, genetic disorders where there's a known monogenic cause, and we can create models of their hearts, of their kidneys, of their brains, and actually really start to use those as complex three-dimensional human models or disease to start to screen drugs. This really is a paradigm shift in drug development uh, and a great opportunity. And many people have proposed this for time, but we've really got to actually see our capacity to do sufficient drug screening to get outcome. So you lead the whole center, but your um, specific research is in the kidney space. Can you tell me yes. a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm a developmental biologist, essentially, and I've spent 30 years looking at how Mammals make kidneys, and kidneys are incredible organs, and they're really vital organs. The concept that uh, you might be able to recreate a kidney from a stem cell is quite out there, but the key problem in kidney disease is the functional unit of the kidney, the nephrons, they're all formed before you're born, and so we don't ever replace them in humans. Uh, and so if you really want to find replacement tissue, you're going to have to start through the process of recreating nephrons the way an embryo would. This is ideally suited for pluripotent stem cells. And we can start with a pluripotent stem cell and get through to a tissue that has 16 different cell types arranged in functional units, which is quite remarkable. We hope that we can treat renal disease this way. That's fascinating. So more broadly, uh, moving away from your, uh, your particular area, how would you describe the state of the science and, and some stem cell therapy today? What what is um, you know most promising, and, and what are some of the areas maybe where there's uh, where there's gaps? So I think the really exciting thing about uh, pluripotent stem cell biology at the moment is we're now starting to see stem cell derived cells going into men. Uh, so initially in eye disease, but now uh, into patients as dopaminergic neurons that are treating the Parkinson's disease, and there are clinical trials going on in the US and in here in, uh, in the Nordic countries. So there's a clinical trial happening in Sweden that one of our researchers is involved with. But they're also, of course, with Vertex going into men for, for diabetes. So we're really now starting to see those cells going into, into clinical trial. And so what had been um, a hope is now starting to become something that we're delivering. I think with that, the ability to modify the cell's genome has really revolutionized what the possibilities are moving forward. And so we're very keen on looking at gene modification approaches, modifying the cell and delivering the cell as the product rather than the gene in the virus. So you talked earlier today a little bit about uh, the fact that, you know, that sometimes the innovation in this space in particular needs a little extra help and needs support from something like the Novo Nordisk Foundation. Can you talk a little more about why that is? So I think it's a very long pipeline from a stem cell all the way through to a product. And we're still at the, really just at the first point of getting those cells into man. And so there's blocks all the way along that chain. Uh, and yes, there will be blocks around the cost, the reimbursement model, the regulatory uh, environment, and all of those are really important. But if you come right back to the very beginning, there are still barriers to fundamental researchers taking the risk of moving their science towards a targeted product, doing those early, risky, complex proof of concept projects when they're primarily being evaluated on the excellence of their science. 
We have to provide them a safe environment where they're willing to take that risk, but are incentivized to do that as well and help them move along the value chain. We also need to bring the end back to the beginning. A researcher who has the best intentions and a great deal of passion about making a particular product from a cell is not always going to understand the regulatory environment, is not going to necessarily know what the competitive space is, is not going to know what the patients need. And actually, they will not even know things like, will my media be able to translate into a clinical grade manufacturing process? So by bringing the end back to the beginning, we can help capacity build and train the scientists to understand what products are feasible and what products are just not feasible or where they'll need to take a different track. So then when you do make that transition into commercialization and sort of letting these researchers become companies that can mm -hmm. uh, stand on their own feet, what does that look like um, for, for you? And how do you kind of advise them and, and manage that transition? I, I actually would uh, really not give the impression that we're going to turn all of these fundamental <laughs> researchers into companies. And I think that's a fear uh, in, in the academic area. But their postdocs, their students, many of these will find this as a career progression that they're really excited about. And so we're really trying to, to nurture the idea further along the value chain. So some of these scientists will move with it and take it all the way to the end, but many of them won't. They'll go back and find another idea. And it's about doing a better process of handing the ball along the chain so that we get things out at the end and not have this attrition. Mm. Uh, at the beginning of the pipeline. But that's sort of all the more reason to prepare them for the end of absolutely. the beginning so that the data is the right data. Yeah, absolutely. You'd be surprised even in this day and age how many researchers think, oh, the best thing for me to do is to publish and then some company will come and buy it. I'm sorry, that isn't going to happen. Or um, my protocol is going to be really, really complex and so no one will copy it. Well, it's probably not going to go through CGMP manufacture. Or I think it's going to be a fabulous way to treat X when actually X is already treatable with a cost-effective drug. So, you know, we really have to have that thought conversation with the scientists really early about, do you really think people want that product or do you really think that's going to have an advantage or do you really think it's feasible to do this? And so we're doing an awful lot of training that where we hope the next generation of, of graduates think about their ideas in a different way. You mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation that you've got um, different institutions in mm -hmm. Australia, the Netherlands, and Denmark. Um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that come with that kind of distributed model? Yeah, so the challenges right up front is, is time difference and distance. For me, it's a very long flight and I go backwards and forwards a lot. Uh, the opportunities, though, are great. You know, what we had, what we managed to create very rapidly is global critical mass. Each of the nodes has a unique set of skills, a uh, set of facilities, research experiences. Uh, in Leiden, it's a very large teaching hospital that has a long history in cell and tissue transplantation. That gives us a clinical interface that's really quite valuable. In Melbourne, we are in a children's medical research institute on a children's hospital campus. So we have access to a lot of the rare genetic diseases that present in childhood but we also have passionate clinicians that are keen on treatments for children. In Copenhagen, there's a long history of fundamental stem cell biology uh, and uh, yet another geographical opportunity, particularly around the environment in Denmark and the environment created by the Marinotis Foundation. Immediately, in a very short period of time, we have linked up all of these opportunities. We have researchers constantly moving from one site to another, tangible collaborations between groups, training opportunities, and we're also centrally supporting resources that will make each of our research programs succeed by enabling each of the three nodes to deliver outcomes that they couldn't previously. Thank you so much for chatting with me, Melissa. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share? Well, I really hope that we do make a difference in terms of the pathway of ideas into outcome in this space uh, by delivering through review. I look forward to seeing that outcome.